Yes, he's got everything fixed. I saw one of the marquees of the local church, and it says, you know, of course, in West Virginia, we would, we would get this. They say duct tape fixed a lot of things. They said, but, but three nails fixed everything. And that's a pretty good truth, isn't it? The, the nails that held Christ upon the cross. We have been discussing the temptations of Christ. And in our, our first part of this four-part series, we just sort of did an overview of the preparation for the temptations. And then we discussed in the first temptation the basis of living by the Word of God. And today we're up to the second temptation here. Uh, this is part three of the series on the second temptation. And this is a temptation about presumption. Now, if you look at the account in Luke and you compare it to the account in Matthew, you find that Luke uh, actually changes the, um, the rotate, or rotates the, the order of the temptations. And uh, Luke gives what Matthew gives is the second temptation, third, and the third temptation, second. But we're following the sequence as it is in Matthew for a couple of reasons. Uh, it does seem to be more logical in that in the first two temptations, Satan comes disguised or pretending to be an angel of light, whereas in the third temptation, or the, at least the third one in Matthew, where he takes Jesus and shows him the kingdoms of the world, and he says, I'll give you all these. He, he, he really is not trying to pretend to be an angel of light anymore. He's coming in his real character. Uh, this is also the order that we have in Matthew is the order given Desire of Ages and how the temptations proceeded. So that's the order that we're working from also. It doesn't mean we couldn't study him from the other order. It just means this is the way that we're doing it. So I'd like to, um, I'd like to put this up like that. Okay, there we go. And uh, we're going to begin, though, by reading about this temptation in Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to start in verse 5, and we'll read through 7. Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. It says, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, it says he took him to the holy city. There was a temple there, and no doubt it's speaking about Jerusalem. Jerusalem has always been considered God's holy city at that time and in the past. And in fact, if we turn to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 16 there, Daniel chapter 9 verse 16, we see Jerusalem uh, identified as God's holy mountain, in fact, Daniel 9, 16. He says, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now, as we noted that at the beginning of this series, that Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan. That was near Jericho. And we know that Jericho is a very low spot because it lies in very close proximity to the Dead Sea, the lowest place geographically on the earth, at least that I know of. And so when Jesus went up into the wilderness, he literally went up. I mean, he was either going west or the east, but either way, there were mountains on either side. But now it seems that Satan has changed the location. Now, there, we know this temptation is going to involve falling. Uh, cast yourself off. God's going to save you. I'm sure there were precipices, there were cliffs that this could have happened in the wilderness. But this would indicate that Satan had another reason for bringing Jesus uh, to, to Jerusalem and to the temple. Because he sought to surround the temptation, if you please, with an air of sanctity, you know, making this some kind of special thing. In Desire of Ages on page 124 and paragraph 3, we find this insightful comment. It says, Satan now supposes that he has met Jesus on his own ground. The wily foe himself presents words that proceed from the mouth of God. He still appears as an angel of light, and he makes it evident that he is acquainted with the scriptures and understands the import 
of what is written. As Jesus before used the word of God to sustain his faith, the tempter now uses it to countenance his deception. He claims, interestingly notice, he claims that he has only been testing the fidelity of Jesus, and he now commends his steadfastness. As the Savior has manifested trust in God, Satan urges him to give still another evidence of his faith. Now, we don't know how Satan transported Jesus to what's called the pinnacle of the temple. We're not told if it was important. I suppose we would be given that information. But the word that we translate pinnacle here in this verse is partar rig neon. And it serves to denote the tip or the extremity of anything, an edge. Uh, it's actually translated borders in Numbers 1538. You remember the children of Israel were to put a border around their garments of, of, of blue, indicating loyalty to the law. And that word that we translate border there is this same word, or at least it is in the Septuagint. It is in the Septuagint, I should say. And it's also translated skirt in Ruth 3.9 in 1 Samuel 15.27. Another translation says, he took him to the highest point of the temple. It would be sort of like if we went out to that high pole out there in the yard, and we went to the high place and said, now this place you can jump off here. But it says it was the pinnacle of the temple. Now we know the temple involved several different um, aspects to what we call the temple here. There were buildings surrounding the temple that were important. Uh, but the Greek word for temple here uh, Heron, it means simply the temple at Jerusalem, including the whole temple precinct with its building courts, etc. Now, notice how Satan begins this temptation, just like he began the first temptation, if thou be the Son of God. He's asking him, if you're really the Son of God, have you ever been asked uh, something that you didn't want to give an answer to? Not directly, at least. We see this happen all the time. We see people, for instance, in our government, when someone goes before the Senate or the Congress uh, for some kind of a deposition or confirmation hearings, uh, a senator or congressperson will ask someone, they'll say, well, do you believe such and such? And they'll never say yes or no. They don't, they don't really directly answer the question. They might say, for instance, do you believe it's okay to kill an infant in the womb through abortion? And the other person might come back and say, I believe every woman should have a right to choose. <laughs> you know, they really don't deal directly with the question. They sort of answer it, but not directly, not directly. And by their redirecting or silence, they really are saying, in this case, for instance, it's really okay to murder a baby. But on the surface here, on the surface of this, a failure of Jesus to answer the question or the challenge of Satan would seem to imply that Jesus was not the Son of God. It's, it's almost like he's forcing him. If, if, you, if you try to prove this, you're wrong, and if you don't, you're, you're denying your sonship to the Father. Now, in the first temptation, Jesus had the opportunity to prove his loyalty as the Son of God and be doing the Father's will. And now Satan comes and he's pressing upon Jesus to prove his loyalty and faith through actions. And you know, there's no people that probably get that better than we do. Think about that for a minute. After all, we like to show our loyalty to God, don't we? We want to demonstrate our loyalty to God. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, so we want to be sure that we're in services on Sabbath. It's a standing testimony. And we know that Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6 it says that faith worketh by what? By love. So faith works. We need to be showing actions. And in fact, the Apostle James in James 2.18, James 2.18, he says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Shew me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. And so this was a kind of temptation, friends, that I think it would be very easy for any of us to enter into this kind of presumption, because we like, again, we want to demonstrate our faith. And Satan says, well, now here's an opportunity for you, Jesus, to demonstrate your faith in God. But this would have been a presumption upon the part of Jesus to do so. I want you to remember when the children of Israel were at the borders of the Promised Land, and they sent out spies to, 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 to look throughout the Promised Land. How many did they send out? Twelve. 
And how many came back with a good report? Two. Two. How many came back with a bad report? Well, the math is easy, 10, right? Yes. And the people decided that they would believe the 10 instead of the 2, although their faith was so weak that if there had only been 2 presenting a bad report and 10 a good report, they would have still rebelled. But they rebelled against God. And God, through, through Moses, told those people they were going to have to go back to the wilderness and they were going to be there for 40 years. Did they like that? God had promised them the promised land. He had promised them the promised land. That's why we call it the promised land. And now they can't have it. And so they have an idea. They say, well, you know what? We're going to go up and take it anyhow. We're going to go up and take it anyhow. In Numbers chapter 14 and verse 40. Numbers 14 verse 40. And they rose up early in the morning and get them up to the top of the mountain saying, Lo, we be here and will go up into the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. We made a mistake, but we're not going to make that mistake again. We're going to go forward in faith now, and we're going to demonstrate. But God had already told them no. God had already said, this is not going to be so now. And if we look in verse 44, we notice here, it says, but they, and what's that next word? Presumed. Presumed. To go up unto the hilltop, nevertheless the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. And what happened to them? They had a terrible defeat. They had a terrible defeat. Many men were lost. But they presumed to go. In other words, God had made a promise. They didn't meet the condition. And now God says you're going back to the wilderness. And the promise has actually been withdrawn. But they're going to try to force God to give them the promise. And that is presumption. Satan has Jesus at the Pentecost Temple, and he's quoting Scripture to him. And I want to tell you, friends, Satan can quote Scripture better than you can. He can quote it backward and forward, and he can take a, a text out of context. He can take a series of texts and put them together to make them look without close scrutiny, like they are teaching a particular idea that they certainly are not. And, uh, and we better know the scriptures better ourselves. But he said, cast thyself down. Surely, surely Satan is urging that such an act of faith in God would be a supreme demonstration that Jesus is really the Son of God. There's a statement in some of the rabbinical literature, uh, and it, it, this is a, a quote from a a quote in the Advanced Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 313. But it says that the rabbis taught that when the, when the King Messiah reveals himself, then he comes and stands on the roof of the holy place. So Jesus, you're really the Messiah. This is where you're supposed to be. Cast yourself down, and then you'll prove that you are the Son of God. What do you think? What have you done it? You might have been tempted to, wouldn't you? Jesus was tempted to do it. But friends, he knew the scriptures well, and he knew that this would be presumption. In Spiritual Gifts, page 32 in paragraph 2, I saw, this is one of those I saw statements. Don't miss out on it. I saw that Christ was the example for all Christians when tempted, or their rights disputed. They should bear it patiently. They should not feel that they have a right to call upon God to display his power that they may obtain a victory over their enemies unless there is a special object in view that God can be directly honored and glorified by it. Let me just pause there for a second. When Elijah was on Mount Carmel, did he ask for God to display his power in a unique and special way? Yes, he did. He said, the God who answers by fire. But you notice here that it says, unless there is a special object in view, and there was a special object in view for Elijah, that they would know that Yahweh is God. And that he could be directly honored and glorified. And so, friends, we need to be very careful. We can go out and we can make challenges. We can make challenges to people today. You know, the God who answers by fire, let him be God. But we better be sure God is sending us with that message. We better be sure God is sending us with that message. Continuing, 
I saw that if Jesus had cast himself from the pinnacle, it would not have glorified the Father, for none would witness the act but Satan and the angels of God. And it would be tempting the Lord to display his power to his bitterest foe. It would have been condescending to the one whom Jesus came to conquer. It would have been obeying Satan. It would have been following the words of Satan instead of the words of God. Now in Desire of Ages, on page 125 and paragraph 1, it says, The tempter thought to take advantage of Christ's humanity and urge him to, what's that next word? Presumption. Presumption. But while Satan can solicit, he cannot compel to sin. Let me pause there for a minute. Satan can solicit. He can urge us. He can tempt us. He can bring the most beautiful, attractive, seemingly beautiful and attractive things before us. But friends, no matter how hard he tries, he cannot compel you to sin. We, we think of people who have been in terribly uh, extraneous circumstances. I think of Richard Rembrandt when he was tortured by the communists and the types of tortures that he tells about. And if you read Solzhenitsyn and, and, and also Fox's Book of Martyrs, etc., and you can see where Christians throughout the ages, some of them have been terribly deprived, terribly tempted, terribly treated. And it says that he can solicit, even under the most difficult circumstances, friends, you can never, never, never be compelled to sin. A man might be tempted to, to have infidelity with his wife because she's just a nag. She's hard. But friends, that's not an excuse, is it? It's not an excuse. No matter how difficult she is to live with or how difficult he is to live with, it's never an excuse. We might think of a co-worker who's always bothering us. And one day we decide it's time we can snap back. Well, I just, he just forced me to act like this. He was so bad to me. No, friends, Satan, if Satan cannot compel you to sin, no human being can ever compel you to sin either. Let me begin again. The tempter thought to take advantage of Christ's humanity and urge him to presumption. But while Satan can solicit, he cannot compel to sin. He said to Jesus, cast thyself down, knowing that he could not cast him down, for God would interpose to deliver him. Nor could Satan force Jesus to cast himself down. Unless Christ should consent to temptation, he could not be overcome. Not all the power of earth or hell could force him, in the slightest degree, to depart from the will of his Father. Desire of Ages 125 and paragraph 1. And beloved, if Jesus is our example, and we believe he is, we've, we read that earlier as well, then not all the power of earth or hell can force you in the slightest of degree to depart from the will of the Father. If you will keep your mind stayed upon Christ and have the mind that was in Christ Jesus, if you will keep yourself in prayer and in the Word of God and you're desiring to do His will, friends, you do not need to ever sin and you need never let anything compel you to sin. Continuing in the next paragraph, in Desire of Ages 125, in paragraph 2, it says again, the tempter can never compel us to do evil. The word compel means force, right? The tempter can never compel us to do evil. He cannot control minds. Oh, you know, it doesn't stop there, though, does it? We might think, well, it's great, he cannot, cannot control my mind, but it doesn't stop there. It says, he cannot control our minds unless they are yielded to his control. So if we yield ourselves to Satan in some way, he can control our minds. The will must consent. Faith must let go on its hold upon Christ before Satan can exercise his power upon us. So friends, if we do not consent, if we hold our faith, then Satan has no power over us. But every, continuing, but every sinful desire we cherish affords him a foothold. Every point in which we fail of meeting the divine standard is an open door by which he can enter to tempt and destroy us. And every failure or defeat on our part gives occasion for him to reproach Christ. Think about that one now. And so, if we apply these things to ourselves, if we apply these things to ourselves, 
Before Satan can exercise his power over us, we must consent the faith, the will to him, and faith must let go. And if we continue to cherish these evil desires, it gives Satan a place and a way to come into our hearts. Satan, friends, again, used the scripture. He knows the scripture. He's a master at the scriptures. And we need to never forget that Satan preaches more sermons through his agents in professed churches than you can imagine. He uses biblical texts, and sometimes not a few, but he misinterprets and he misapplies those scriptures. The Bible tells us that we are to rightly divide the word of truth, right? But Satan wrongly divides the word of truth. But now Satan has come to Jesus with a reasoning for departing from the path of duty. Satan, he takes the scriptures and he twists and manipulates them to the exact opposite of what they actually claim. And you've seen that too, haven't you? There's this great issue of women's ordination in the Adventist church right now. And people are taking the very scriptures that would keep us on the straight and narrow path and using some of those very scriptures to try to justify a, a, a more modern, a new modeled of the causeway, we might say, as it says in the Great Controversy. Satan makes it appear that God approves, friends, of a sinful course of action, using the scriptures to try to defend that. Satan said he'll give his angels charge of you. Now, where did Lucifer get that idea? He got it from the scriptures. That's right. It's, it, it's in uh, Psalms 91, 11 and 12. But I noticed here on the slide, I, I have here for you Matthew 4, 6, and Psalms 91, 11, and 12 together. And you know that they look almost alike, but there's one part that Satan left out. You see, in Matthew 4, 6, it says, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. In their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. But in Psalms 91, verses 11 and 12, it says, For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So what is the difference? It says to keep thee in all thy ways, and our ways are to be the ways of God's ways. We're to be doing God's will, and when we're not in God's way, anything else can happen, friends. I mentioned some of you, I was in Morgantown this last week visiting with uh, some of my family, helping them with some illness. And when I was a young man, uh, well, I wasn't even a man, I was a boy, too stupid to know better. I happened to be in Morgantown, that city one day with some friends, and uh, we ended up in, in, in a little place down some steps into a bar. And this last week, I was doing some running in Morgantown while the hospice nurse was visiting with my cousins so they could be alone and do their thing. And I was running downtown some, and you know, I came across that very place on High Street in Morgantown that I had went down that one day and uh, found a lot of alcohol and became inebriated, we might say. You know, but I had went looking for trouble that day. I went looking for trouble that day, and there was no way that God could protect me because I wasn't walking in the ways of God that day when I was a young boy. No, friends, God wants us to walk in His ways, and when we are walking on His paths, it's a lot safer. It's like if you're going down a, a, a road, and here are two branches, and one branch of the road is, uh, is safe to walk on, the other has edges and precipices and, and dark places upon it, and it should be obvious which one we should go on. We should go on the safe path. God's way is the safe path, friends. But Satan's way, stepping onto his enchanted ground, when we do that, the promises of God cannot keep us. They will not keep us. And Jesus refused to depart from the pathway of strict obedience to the will of the Father. Continuing in Desire of Ages on page 125 in paragraph 3, it says, Jesus refused to go outside the path of obedience while manifesting perfect trust in his Father, he would not place himself unbidden 
in a position that would necessitate the interposition of his father to save him from death. He would not force providence to come to his rescue and thus fail of giving man an example of trust and submission. Now notice it says he would not place himself unbidden in a position that would necess necessitate the inter interposition of God. There may be times we need to do that. But friends, we will never do it unnecessarily. This is why, friends, I don't stretch a rope across the New River Gorge and try to walk across it with a pole. I, it would be presumptuous for me to do that. I would have to expect God's going to save me because I'm not going to get very far out on that rope before I fall. Right? But I could say, I have this promise of Psalms 91, 11 and 12. But again, it's in all thy ways and not my own ways. Now I want to ask you a question concerning this. What about placing ourselves where not just simply physical death could happen, where we could be falling, but what about spiritual death? What if we are placing ourselves in an atmosphere where Satan's message is being given? The agents of Satan are there, and the methods of Satan, like NLP and other things, are being used. Can I count and ask God to, can I count on him and ask him to keep me in that kind of a situation? Friends, we need to be very careful about the places that we go spiritually. We might not be visiting certain churches. You may never go to a Catholic Mass. You may never go to an Evangelical Pentecostal Revival meeting. But oh, how we like to tune into YouTube and listen to this preacher or that preacher, who maybe is a member of the Adventist Church even. But they're preaching some of the lies of Satan and of hell. And can we really ask God to keep us in those situations? Charles Spurgeon told a story one time of a lady who made an advertisement for a coachman, someone to drive her coach around for her. And she had three different candidates come in. And she asked each the same question. She took the first one. She asked him the question. She says, I want a really good coachman to drive my pair of horses and therefore, I ask you, how near can you drive to danger and still be safe? How near can you drive to danger and still be safe? Well, he said, I could drive very near indeed. I could go within a foot of a precipice without fear of any accident so long as I held the reins. She promptly dismissed him. She asked the second one the same question. How near to danger could you drive? And uh, being determined to get the place, he said, I could drive within a hair's breadth and yet skillfully avoid any mishap. And she said, you will not do either. And she dismissed him. And so she came to the third, but his mind was cast in a slightly different mold. And so she, she asked the question to him, how near could you drive to danger? And he said, madam, I've never tried. I've never tried. It's always been a rule with me to drive as far from danger as I possibly can. Of course, he got the job. See, in like manner, friends, I believe that man who is careful to conduct a, a, a life that does not involve these kind of risks, to refrain from all conduct that could cause us problems, uh, having a fear of God, that that person is the safe person, the person who stays far away. It's like the old saying, you know, uh, the, 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 the little idea about, you know, not falling out of bed at night. How do you not fall out of bed? You don't sleep near the edge. You know, you don't get, the closer you get to the edge, the more likely you are to fall out of bed, right? The closer we get to the edge of sin, friends, the more likely we are to fall. And the more surely we are putting ourselves in a presumptuous situation. No, Lord, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that at all. Presumption has its, at, at its roots pride, daring. But friends, God's people are to be humbled. Think about that. Pride and daring, they allow us to be presumptuous. But I want you to notice what God says in Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 11. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 11. God says, And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. He says, I'm going to cause the arrogancy, the proud, to cease. He's going to take those people who are presumptuous, and they will never be presumptuous again. Again, Satan said, it is 
written. It is written. Satan had taken a text out of context and even removed a part of it. And so oftentimes we presume upon the goodness of God that we are going to do this or we're going to do that. But I think of what James says in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. He says, go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue their year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. In other words, we're go- the Lord's promised to keep us in all his ways when we are walking in his ways. And so if this is the Lord's will, we seek the Lord's will. If it's the Lord's will, then we can walk in this way. But if it's not the Lord's will, we won't. And how is it that we primarily determine the will of the Lord? Through the word of God, through what his word tells us. I think a, a prime example of presumption to be found at the Tower of Babel. Had God promised not to destroy the world by a flood again? He had, hadn't he? He had made a promise. His word was given. In fact, there was no condition on it even. He didn't say, I won't destroy the world by a flood again if you do this or that. He just said, no, I'm not going to do it. But the people didn't believe the promise, did they? They didn't believe the promise. And uh, their lives demonstrated that. But Jesus met the temptation again with the word of God. He met it with the Word of God. And if someone came to you and started quoting the Word of God to you, like maybe, for instance, they might quote Revelation 1.10. Well, I was in the Spirit of the Lord's Day, and we ought to be keeping Sunday because that's the Lord's Day. Now, we could answer and we could say, well, look, look, you, you've got the calendar mixed up. Or the early Christians didn't keep Sunday, and we can prove this by history, and this didn't come in until such and such time, and the Council of Laodicea and so on. But we could just simply also quote Scripture to them, couldn't we? We could quote Isaiah 58 and verse 13, where God says that the Sabbath is my holy day. In other words, when we meet twisted Scripture, when we meet Scripture out of context, the best way to meet it is with other Scripture, just like Jesus did. Just like Jesus did. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. He was quoting scripture. He said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You see, Satan was using a text out of its context, removing part of it. And and, and Jesus replied back with scripture. But think about how misleading a text can be sometimes. If we don't put it in a context or if we separate it from other scriptures, or we have a preconceived construction upon what that scripture means, like Revelation 1.10, we have a preconceived idea that it means Sunday, right? Or we could take Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, a text that I find fully substantially fits in the Bible, but when we put it by itself and we put a context with it already that's not given in the scripture, the first John 5, 7 text as well could even be considered in the same way. It appears to be teaching something that is not in harmony with the body of Scripture. Friends, a given passage must be understood in harmony with all other Scriptures. The claim that the Scriptures may be made to teach anything and everything is true only when this principle is violated. When the Word of God is taken as a whole, and you take the whole Bible, the Old and the New Testament, comparing verse with verse, we find that the whole Bible is clear and it is harmonious. He said, you're not to tempt the Lord your God. And in fact, when you look in verse 16 at the end of it, it says, as you tempted him in Massa. Now, what did that mean? Well, Massa made reference to when they were in the wilderness, the children of Israel were in the wilderness, and they murmured for water. You can read about it in Exodus chapter 17. In all God had done, his providence given them of how he was leading them. I mean, he brought them out of Egypt through great miracles. He parted the Red Sea. The manna had already started to fall at this point. 
They had seen the bountiful hand of God. They had seen the gracious hand of God. They had seen the strong defensive arm of God. And now, now they're going to murmur and complain and lose faith. In Patriarchs and Prophets, on page 297, paragraph 3, it says, when they had been so abundantly supplied with food, they remembered with shame their unbelief and murmurings and promised to trust the Lord in the future. But they soon forgot their promise and failed at the first trial of their faith. Are we like that sometimes? God helps us. Our faith gets established a little bit. And then we come to the next trial. And it's a little harder now because he expects a little bit more. He wants us to develop. He wants us to grow, right? And, and we fail him. In spite of the evidence of divine love for their needs, they had sinned. In Exodus 17, and in verse 7 there, it says, And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? It says that they tempted God. And the response that Moses gave when Recalling that situation was, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. They were, in effect, putting God to the test, challenging him to prove that he was God. Can you imagine? I mean, that, that sounds so ludicrous, but think about it. It would be like a, a little child asking the parent, prove you're, prove you're my mommy or my daddy. You know, who are you? Are you really taking care of me? And, of course, we know that we take care of our children. We love our children. We cherish our children. God cherishes his people. But sometimes we play the fool. Sometimes we act pretty stupid. And we, we, we lack faith to believe that all that he is. You know, the Bible says that he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that what? Diligently, Diligently seek him. That's right. Remember where the text is? Hebrews 11, verse 6, is it? Hebrews 11, 6. But we must believe in God and believe diligently in Him. It was in this same spirit that Satan now proposed that Christ should put his father to the test. Just like the Israelites were putting God to a test, now Satan is trying to propose to Jesus the same kind of a test. Instead of accepting by faith the Father's proclamation at the Jordan River, affirming Him to be the Son of God, Jesus was to experiment, if you please. He was to cast himself off the pinnacle of the temple in order to prove to his satisfaction that he must be so. But such an experiment would reflect doubt rather than faith. Because you've got to make sure. You're not sure yet, but this is the way I'll be sure. That's a pretty tough gamble to make, isn't it? What if you're not right? Well, what about us? What about us? Friends, we are never to place ourselves carelessly or without need, in a position where God would need to intervene to save us from our foolish actions. And that includes physical as well as spiritual. We are not to presume upon God to rescue us when we rush unbidden into danger. We need faith. We need a mature faith which will lead us to order our lives in harmony with what God has already revealed to us, and then to put our trust in Him for everything else. For everything else. In Desire of Ages, on page 126, in paragraph 1, But faith is in no sense allied to presumption. Only he who has true faith is secure against presumption. Now notice this very eloquent part. For presumption is Satan's counterfeit of faith. Faith claims God's promises and brings forth fruit in obedience. Presumption also claims the promises, but uses them, as Satan did, to excuse transgression. Faith would have led our first parents to trust the love of God and to obey His commands. Presumption led them to transgress His law, believing that His great love would save them from the consequences of their sin. It is not faith that claims the favor of heaven without complying with the conditions on which mercy is to be granted. Genuine faith has its foundation in the promises and provisions of the scriptures. So, friends, I just can't take a cigarette out, light it up, and start smoking it, and say, but God loves me. 
And he's not going to let me get cancer. He's not going to let me be harmed by this because God loves me. That's presumption, isn't it? It's presumption. Does God love you? Of course he loves you. But is, go is he going to allow you to continue in sin? No, not like that. Well, friends, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 here, we have a beautiful promise for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. He says, There hath no temptation taken you. Now let me just go back. We see Christ in the wilderness, his temptations, right? And he was tempted a lot, wasn't he? Greater than we'll ever be tempted. And it says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. And he'll do that, friends, every time if you are in his will. If you are walking according to his ways, you can guarantee and claim this promise every time you are tempted. But if you are tempted and you're not walking in his ways, you know, if I go back to Morgantown and walk down those steps at High Street into that basement and order up a Budweiser and just, well, I just want to smell and see what it's like, you know, I'm not safe. I'm not safe. I haven't had an alcoholic drink for, for um, 45 years, probably. But I could take one tomorrow. I could take one today under the wrong circumstances. And I don't want to put myself in that position to where that could ever happen again. In Psalms 15, verses 14 and 15, this, this is a psalm for us today. Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. That's what I want to do today. What about you? You want to do that? I want to do that today, friends. I want to honor and glorify God. I want to be able to call upon Him. But I can't call upon Him if I'm not walking according to His ways, if I'm not meeting the conditions the promises are based upon. You see, faith claims the promise and meets the conditions of obedience the promise is based upon. Again, presumption likes to claim the promise also, but it doesn't meet the conditions of God. Friends, let us not tempt the Lord our God. Instead, let us live by what? Faith. By faith. We are to live by faith, to walk by faith, and as we will do that, and faith is based in what? The Word of God. That's right. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing what? The Word of God. If we will keep ourselves and our minds filled and, and uh, uh, just stoked full of the Word of God, friends, and live by that word, then no matter what temptations come to us, we will be able to resist just like Jesus did. And when someone even quotes scripture to us, misquoting, out of context, uh, cutting portions out, we will have a thus saith the Lord to counteract it. But unless we're studying the scriptures, we can't have that. And we need the power of the scriptures. The word of God is powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. That's right. Hebrews, where's that found? 412. That's right. Very good. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. And may God help you, friends, to overcome all temptations because you're walking in all of God's ways and you're meeting the conditions the promises are based upon. And may he bless you lots and lots and lots. 